Hello again, this is Robert Whittaker, and this is the first of a series on embryology. First, we're going to look at a few facts about the early development of the fetus, and then we'll look at the fertilization, and then at the early stages of implantation. But first, let me tell you about many of the images that accompany these six embryological podcasts. Although I have redrawn each one myself, they are based on the images that are found in the 5th and 11th editions of what I regard as the best embryological textbook for both students and others interested. The book is called Langman's Medical Embryology by T.W. Sadler and is published in its latest 11th edition by Lippincott, Williams and Wilkins. The format, the clarity and the up-to-date information are all outstanding and I thoroughly recommend this book to all my students and to you the listeners. We can divide up the 40 weeks of gestation of the fetus into two quite definite periods. The first part is the embryonic period which lasts for about eight weeks and during this time there is formation of the organs and differentiation of the tissues. And then the next period is the fetal period, which is the rest of the pregnancy. And it is during this time that we get maturation of the organs. When you think about this early development, the embryo itself needs to increase in size and of course also to increase in the complexity and the specialization of its cells. And then underlying all this, there's the long-term organization with patterning and coding of the tissues. In the body plan, we're going to see examples of bilateral symmetry and later on some quite definite evidence of asymmetry, as for instance in the gut development and in the cardiac development. It's quite useful to think of the body as a double tube, a gut essentially surrounded by a coelomic cavity, and then a hole at either end. The development of the multi-layer of the body wall is of course a complex issue which we'll try to make clear if we can. But these layers essentially are of ectoderm, which is skin and the sense organs and the central nervous system, and then mesoderm, which is the skeleton, the cardiovascular system, the muscles, etc. And then the endoderm, which lines the gut and the respiratory system. Now, there are two important issues that we need to look at. One is meiosis and the other is mitosis. Let's start with mitosis, which is the division of the mature cell into two separate cells. Now, we're going to start off with any mature cell as having 46 chromosomes. This is two pairs of 23, of which one of the 23 is either an X or a Y. So the mature male cell will have 46, of which two are either X or Y chromosomes, and the female cell will have 46, of which the two sex chromosomes are both XX. In contrast to this meiosis, in the female is the change from a 46 XX cell to a 23 component of which one of these chromosomes is an X. In the male it's slightly different in that we start off with a 46XY cell which we call the diploid cell and this is going to divide down into the haploid cell which will produce sperm which contain either 23 of which one is a Y or 23 of which one is an X. These we call the mature sperm or the spermatozoan. These will combine with the female oocyte, which we said has got 23 chromosomes, of which one is an X, and these will combine with either the X or the Y sperm to form either a zygote of 46XY or 46XX. I appreciate that this is a little complex, but it's very easy to read further about this in any standard textbook. Now a point that must be made clear is before we get division of these cells, and it doesn't matter whether it's meiosis or mitosis, we need to double the amount of nuclear material in the cell before the division occurs. 
Now this is done by each chromosome pulling apart so that it becomes two chromatids. And no sooner has this occurred, this uncoiling, that the exposed sites on the chromatids are immediately filled by new bases. And in this way we end up with the double amount, or so-called tetraploid amount of nuclear material. With mitosis, a simple division, will end up back with the normal diploid number. But in the meiotic division, during the first division, which is called the prophase, there is crossing over of the chromatids to mix the gene, and then there is genetic recombination. If this didn't occur, there would be no change in the chromosome constitution between the parent and the child. At the end of this first biotic division, we're back to the diploid number of 2n, as it's called, but at this stage, each of the cells contain chromatids, but in twice the normal number. And then in the second stage of meiosis division, there's no further synthesis of DNA, but the number of the chromatids is simply halved to the haploid number with 23 single chromosomes in the form of chromatids. So, for instance, in the male, we get a meiotic division, which goes from a primary spermatocyte to a secondary spermatocyte, and then finally to spermatids. Half these spermatids will have 22 plus an X, and half will have 22 plus a Y. On the female side, we go from a primary oocyte to a secondary oocyte to a mature oocyte. But as each time there is a division, a polar body is thrown off and only the main cell keeps all the nuclear material. Now after that uh, brief description of meiosis we can now look at fertilization itself. If we look at the oocyte at the time of fertilization it will just be completing its second meiotic division and it will be surrounded by a zona pellucida and also some cells which protect it, called the corona radiator. A large number of spermatozoa will approach this oocyte. Each may release its acrosomal content to try to dissolve the corona radiator, and it's possible that several might attack the zona pellucida. But once one sperm has made inroads within this zona pellucida, the other sperm fall away and the plasma membrane of this sperm will fuse with the lining of the oocyte. Two membranes fuse and only the nuclear material of one sperm is allowed to enter the oocyte. So now at this stage we have the, both the male and the female pronuclei within the zona pellucida. These two pronuclei, each with 23 lots of nuclear material, will now fuse, and with this fusion there will be a restoration of the diploid number. Thereafter, all divisions are mitotic, and so two cells will be formed after some 30 hours, and then four cell stage at about 40 hours, and this cleavage results in blastomeres. At about four days, there are about 16 cells, and this structure is now called the morella. The cells within the morella keep dividing until there's finally 128 cells. And it's about this stage that the morella reaches the uterine cavity. As it does so, the zona pellucida begins to disappear and fluid enters the intercellular spaces and becomes a single cavity, which we're going to call the blastocele. The embryo itself is now a blastocyst, the cells within this blastocyst are pushed towards one end of this blastocele, and the cells are now called an embryoblast, or an inner cell mass. The blastocele within the blastocyst is orientated in such a way that it is the inner cell mass which meets the uterine wall. And we now begin to get early implantation of this blastocyst, round about the sixth day. The trophoblastic cells, which are on the outside of the blastocyst, are the first to touch the uterine epithelium. These trophoblast cells produce a proteolytic enzyme that allows early invasion into the uterine wall.
but the uterine wall itself is receptive to this and promotes this attachment as a mutual activity. The trophoblastic cells begin to invade the uterine wall and they produce an amorphous mass of tissue which is called the syncytio trophoblast in which there's virtually no mitotic activity. But this syncytio trophoblast gets into contact with the uterine stroma in which of course there are many uterine blood vessels. The uterine epithelium begins to heal over so that the blastocyst is within the uterine wall itself. The inner cell mass or the embryoblast now forms a plate of cells which are called the epiblast. Other cells just beneath this epiblast are called the hypoblast and the two structures together become known as the bilamina germ cell disc. Between the epiblast cells and the trophoblast a cavity appears which is to become the amniotic cavity. It's lined by cells which have come from the epiblast and these are called amnioblast cells. Beneath these two layers of epiblast and hypoblast the blastocyst cavity is still present. In the next stage, which is about the ninth day, lacunae or little lakes appear within the syscytio trophoblast and these shortly will become very closely associated with the large uterine blood vessels in the endometrial stroma. The cellular component of the trophoblast, which is now called the cytotrophoblast, begins to invade into the uterine wall more and more with the formation of early villi. The amniotic cavity enlarges and the hypoblast cells beneath the epiblast begin to grow round to line the early blastocele cavity which is now become known as the primitive yolk sac. At this stage the uterine wall is almost healed over but there is a small fibrin plug in the gap. Surrounding this primitive yolk sac is a new layer of tissue which is going to be called the extra embryonic mesoderm. It's lined by a thin membrane which we call the exocelomic membrane. By the twelfth day, the uterine vessels have invaded the lacunae in the syncytiotrophoblast and we've got the very beginnings of the placental circulation. Meanwhile, the amniotic cavity is now lined completely with amnioblasts. The epiblast has become a flat plate of rather large cells and the hyperblast is beginning to grow round further around the primitive yolk sac. Meanwhile, in the extra embryonic mesoderm, which we've described as surrounding the primitive yolk sac, there appears spaces. It's like a splitting of the mesoderm into two layers. The inner layer we call the splanchnopleuric and the outer layer is the somatopleuric layers. Later these splitting areas open up a cavity completely to separate these two layers of extra embryonic mesoderm. And this space between them we call the extra embryonic coelome. By about the 13th day the invasion of the uterine vessels into the lacunae are beginning to form what we call maternal sinusoids. The epiblast and the hyperblast are now established as quite definite a bilaminar germ disc and the villi from the cytotrophoblast are beginning to grow into the uterine wall more and more. The extra embryonic coelome enlarges enormously and pushes the blastocyst towards the uterus more and more until finally it is simply attached to the lateral wall by a thin connecting stalk which will eventually become the umbilical cord. The lacunae at this stage have extended all round the blastocyst and the utero-placental circulation has begun. From here on we're going to concentrate on the blastocyst itself and see how the bilaminar disc is going to become trilaminar with gastrulation but we'll leave that for a further podcast. Thank you for listening to this first podcast on the embryology.